On Sunday, we finished working through 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and one of the things we talked about was the fact that Paul had said the Thessalonians were his crown, and he got a great deal of joy from that. So we worked through what exactly Paul meant by that, and we talked about uh, what else the Bible has to say about crowns. And one of these things is that we noted there are five crowns that the Bible explains are available for Christians to earn. And so we talked through what those crowns were, and we worked through where we could find them in the Bible and what it would take to earn them. And one point that I kind of touched on, but we really didn't have time to develop fully was, I noted that when you read about these crowns, if you do some research about them, if you look through some commentaries or read articles or, or whatever your favorite research material is, if you look at a number of different sources, you might notice, as I did, that over time, the general trend is that the view that commentators and scholars have about these crowns is changing. Now, this is not 100%, but I think there is a trend going. You know, for whatever reason, a lot of the source material or research material that I like to look at comes from the 1800s. I don't know why, it just there seems to be a lot of good stuff from that era that I happen to have in my library. But it's very interesting when you look at information, commentaries, uh, things that theologians were writing about crowns and other things, quite frankly, during the 1800s or at other periods of time and compare that to what's being written today. An absolutely fascinating thing will come out. Here's how that works. When we're reading scripture, the number one most important thing to bring to the table when interpreting what we're reading is context. We need to look at the scripture within its immediate context. What do the passages say around the ones that, uh, the one that we're trying to interpret? But in addition to the immediate context, we also have to understand historical context. What did the original writer mean? What, was, what would his original audience have understood that writing to mean? The fact of the matter is the Bible was written in a time and place that are very far away from where we are. People interpret things a little bit differently. People's backgrounds are all a little bit different. And so when we're reading scripture, we have to be careful to put our minds or to put ourselves in a state of mind like the original audience would have been when they read to make sure we properly understand this. And so one of the purposes of commentaries and other research material written by Bible scholars is, yes, help us to understand what it is the Bible is trying to say, what do the Greek words mean, and, and all that good stuff. But also one of the big things is to bridge a gap between the culture, the time and place of when the Bible was written, and the time and place of our culture today. And in order to do that, the commentary or the Bible scholar will attempt to build a bridge between Bible times and whatever time it is that they're writing. And by looking at the bridges that have been built, we can observe the gap that happened to exist between biblical times and the time that the reference material was created. And so the fascinating thing is when you compare different reference materials, you really see how, how our society has changed. And when you observe that, generally what you see is a dumbing down of our faith. And we see this from two angles. Older materials generally assume that the reader is better educated than newer materials do. Older materials also seem to not be so afraid to dive into some serious complexities of the Bible, while newer materials tend to spoon feed us and keep things superficial because apparently we just aren't as spiritually mature as we used to be. So bringing this idea back to looking at crowns, uh, let's look at what commentators and scholars used to say about these crowns and what they're saying today. And again, this isn't 100%, but this does seem to be a general trend that I observed when putting uh, last Sunday's message together. We'll walk through these five crowns. The first one is the crown of righteousness. And as we said on Sunday, this is a crown reserved for the people who led the most righteous of lives. Remember, we have righteousness imputed into us by the blood of Christ if we have accepted him as a savior. But this crown isn't talking about that righteousness righteousness. This is talking about the righteousness that you display in your Christian life after you've been displayed. And the suggestion here is from this biblical crown that those who display very large amounts of it will be rewarded. At least that's what the old commentaries used to say. 
But today they seem to all just be focused on this idea that we're all really righteous. All of us have been washed clean by the blood of Christ. And so we're all going to get this crown. Second was the incorruptible crown. And this was the one that was uh, traditionally viewed as being a crown that was reserved for people who had made the greatest sacrifices for their faith. And our example was a missionary um, whom I knew who left the comforts of New Jersey and moved way out into a, the jungles of a third world nation to uh, help spread the message of the gospel. And I don't know that man's going to get this crown, but that seems to be the type of man that this crown seems to be reserved for. At least that's what the old uh, thought used to say. But now scholars and authors seem to be more of the mind that we all suffer. All of us have a hard time in life. And so to sort of offset that or recognize what all of us are going through, uh, the prevailing uh, thought today is that we're all going to receive this incorruptible crown when we get to heaven. The crown of life, same thing here. Traditional view was very strict. Many people said you had to be martyred to actually receive this crown or at least suffer greatly, even if it wasn't to the point of death. Whereas today, people look at it and say, hey, the Bible says all of us are going to suffer. All of us are going to be persecuted. Therefore, all of us are going to receive this crown too. The crown of glory, same thing here here traditionally interpreted and if you read as the bible uh, lays it out it really sounds like this is a crown that's reserved only for some pastors and elders and yes maybe some people teaching in another capacity too but uh, now the prevailing thought seems to be that well we all teach somebody something or shepherding is a a group effort it takes a village to raise a christian so we're all going to get this crown too and lastly we have the crown of rejoicing which is where, why we started talking about crowns in the first place, because this comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is what we call the soul winner's crown. And here we were talking about Paul calling the Thessalonians his crown. And he said that was his joy. And so this crown has traditionally been held to be one that would be received by people who were instrumental in bringing some number of people to the faith. And we don't know how many it was, but you had to be instrumental in people's salvation. At least that was the old way of thinking about it. But now the rejoicing crown, people say, is just available to all Christians who rejoice. We're all going to get that one too, apparently, at least according to Bible scholars here in the 21st century. My, my, how things have changed, right? These are two very, very different takes on scripture. They're two completely different interpretations. And when we have such diverging interpretations of scripture, we have to recognize that both interpretations cannot be right. You cannot have the traditional view of very limited uh, use of these crowns and the current view of everyone gets the crowns and both of those things be true. It just can't work that way. Now, for some of us, it's really easy to say that the old way is the better one. And we say that because outside of technology and medicine, just generally, that's what seems to be true. But that approach is not foolproof. Yes, most of the time, older is better, previous exceptions excluded. But that's insufficient for a biblical hermeneutic. We need to be a little bit more precise on deciding how to interpret our Bible other than just, well, the oldest interpretation is this particular thing. So a better way to go about figuring Figuring out which of these approaches is the correct one is to look at other scripture. The best way to interpret scripture is with other scripture. So if we think about that, we can ask the question, how does the Bible handle these crowns? So if we're going to look at what scripture has to say about crowns, three of the five crowns are introduced to us by the writings of Paul. So let's look at what Paul has to say about his approach to ministry. First Corinthians chapter nine, verses 24 to 27. And we covered this twice last Sunday, but it bears repeating. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul's writing and Paul's life does not seem to reflect this modern interpretation of crowns. He doesn't say that we all get these things. He doesn't say, thanks for coming out, here's your crown. He says, you Christian, you need to work to earn these crowns. That's what he's doing himself. He's setting the example. 
Emulate me as I emulate Jesus, Paul says. When we read Paul, it's pretty clear he was not thinking that we're going to be graded on effort or just participation. Paul says it's all about the results. And again, in his writings, we read about three of these five crowns. And for the other two, they're presented the very same way. They don't read by default like participation trophies either. Crowns are meant to be an honor completely decoupled from the gift of salvation. As such, that honor must be earned. I hope that's clear. The old interpretation of crowns is the right one. They are all limited editions. There is not enough of them to go around for everyone. All of us are not going to get all of them, and they have to be earned, every single one. But this solution brings up one final question. If the old way is the right way, then why does the new stuff read differently? What's the deal with all these participation trophies? Well, the sad fact of the matter is Western society, especially American culture, has shifted away from being servants of God, or in our case, one nation under God, to being worshipers of pleasure and worshipers of ourselves. And honestly, these teachings about crowns are just a little too challenging for many people today to accept. And so demand is out there now, unfortunately, for teachings that are just a little bit easier to swallow. But the Bible talks about this too. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. I don't think anything else needs to be said about this. Hope this has been helpful. I hope this has been interesting. And until next time, Lord willing, there is a next time. May God bless you and your family.